The third question we ask when evaluating secondary research studies is what information was collected? When we inspect a secondary study closely, did the study actually measure what it appears they measure? Here's an interesting example from this article called The Association of Point-of-Sale Cigarette Marketing with Cravings to Smoke, results from a cross-sectional population-based study. This study looked at what induced people to have smoking cravings amongst people who are already smokers. In particular, it was looking closely to see if point-of-sale cigarette displays, point-of-sale cigarette advertisements, and point-of-sale cigarette promotions had a relationship with people having smoking cravings when they were exposed to that advertising content. When quickly scanning the results of the article, it appears that point-of-sale tobacco displays have a strong effect on inducing smoking cravings in smoking individuals. Point-of-sale tobacco ads have a moderate effect on inducing smoking cravings in smoking uh, individuals. And tobacco, pro tobacco promotions did not have a statistically significant relationship with people having smoking cravings. However, it is necessary for us to look a little closer and see exactly how these things were measured to see if this conclusion is actually valid. It turns out this study wasn't about actual exposure to tobacco marketing, but instead someone's recollection of exposure to tobacco marketing. Look on the left-hand side. These three questions represent the survey questions that were asked of smokers when they were reflecting on their exposure to tobacco marketing. For example, look at the first one. When you are in a store in your neighborhood, how often do you notice tobacco ads? The respondent answered on a one to five scale, never to always. These three different measures correspond to these three different tobacco displays, tobacco ads, and tobacco promotions. In addition, smokers weren't actually reporting their actual level of smoking cravings. They were recalling their level of smoking cravings when they were in a store that had tobacco advertising. If you look on the right here, they asked the three following questions. When you are in a store in your neighborhood that sells tobacco products, how often do you, one, feel a craving for a cigarette, two, feel like nothing would be better than smoking a cigarette, and three, feel like all you want is a cigarette. And again, for each one of these three questions, people responded on the same five point never to always scale. So upon closer inspection, this study didn't measure individuals' exposure to tobacco ads and whether it caused smoking cravings. Instead, it was an individual's recollection of seeing tobacco marketing and their recollection of feeling smoking cravings at a store that sells tobacco. This was the correlation that was, that was found in the study, not a direct causal effect of actual exposure and actual craving. This example, does a nice job of illustrating why marketing researchers need to evaluate what was actually measured rather than what just what might appear to be have been measured when we're evaluating secondary data studies. If you were a policymaker trying to decide new legislation for tobacco advertising in stores, we might want to be hesitant about using this individual study to reach any broad conclusions because it wasn't a direct study of people's exposure to tobacco advertising, instead it was just their recollection. This study actually did a very nice job of reporting all of its data collection procedures. That's why I was able to use it for this particular example. Let's take a look at the world of political opinion polling to understand why it is so important to understand how a researcher collected their data. Now you're in a marketing research class, so you may wonder why we're using an example out of political polling. Whether we're doing marketing research or political polling, the protocols and policy for good questionnaire design and data collection are exactly the same. It just so happens that we tend to ask questions about slightly different topics. Of course, if you were selling a product that is a robot politician, perhaps that's an intersection of new product marketing research and political polling. Just kidding. So let's take a look at a summary section from the website 538. If you haven't heard of 538, it's a very famous website that they act as a poll aggregator and they aggregate political polls to then build a single unified prediction for uh, various political races in the United States. Now, when they integrate different polls from different polling companies, they first evaluate the overall quality of those polls. And there's two things that they look at particularly closely. One of those is how the data itself is collected. In the world of political opinion polling, it is known and demonstrated through uh, analysis of performance that live telephone interviews, including cell phone numbers, is sort of the premium best way to collect uh, people's opinions about what candidates they're likely to vote for. 
lower on the quality standard for political polls is what is called IVR or interactive voice response polls. These are like robo polls. This would be when a robot calls you up and walks you through a survey and you're responding actually to a robot. Finally, when data collection is using online mechanisms for public opinion polling in politics, it is often considered an indicator of very low quality. Not only does it matter how the data was collected, but it also depends on the clarity with which those procedures are reported upon and explained to those people who wish to critique and understand how someone conducted their research. The American Association for Public Opinion Research, for example, has a transparency initiative. This is something that a polling company can subscribe to, and by following their guidelines for reporting their procedures, it's much more clear to any external party how this data and study was actually collected. 538 evaluates the quality of different polling companies based on the method of data collection, their participation in various transparency initiatives, and also then compares the predictions made by those companies' polls versus the actual outcomes of elections. Merged together, they assign a letter grade to the quality of a particular polling company. If you look at the right here, I'm grabbing just a small snapshot of the many, many different polling companies, purposely grabbing the highest rated and some of the lowest rated, and we can clearly see that pollsters like Marist College and Monmouth University uh, have an A-plus rating, and they in fact do live telephone interviews with cell phones, and they do follow the transparency initiative. On the other hand, political pollsters SurveyMonkey and Google Surveys rely on online polling and generally don't participate in the AAPOR transparency initiative, although Google Surveys does and their overall grade is quite low. In fact, they almost nearly don't even qualify to be integrated into 538's um, aggregated polling and predictions. Uh, just a side note here, uh, when these letter grades are specific to their polls used to predict political candidates, uh, Google Surveys and SurveyMonkey are still high quality tools that can be used for other applications, but specifically to political polling, they seem to perform uh, quite poorly. Even if the sample is representative of the population that we intend to study, we need to verify whether the way the secondary data was generated may have contaminated the result. In fact, this exact issue has been discussed in the popular news media in 2016 over the lawsuit of Trump University. If you haven't followed the news, do a quick search for Trump University lawsuit and you'll find extensive information. For our purposes, it suffice to say that the Trump University is presently being sued in civil court uh, for fraud, uh, false advertising, and unfair business practices. One of the ways that Trump University has defended itself in saying that it wasn't practicing anything unfair is that it says that 98% of all the individuals who completed satisfaction surveys at the end of Trump University events uh, were actually satisfied with the experience. If you go to 98%approval.com right now, you can actually go and download hundreds of megabytes of PDFs of uh, anonymized event satisfaction sheets. Here's one being represented right now, and there are literally hundreds upon hundreds of pages of this. In aggregate, it turns out the way the satisfaction surveys were conducted draws into question whether or not we can actually trust these results. From a New York Times article, there were some individuals who reported that the way they collected satisfaction surveys suggests that we can't trust this information. For example, Robert Gilo claims that the teacher of the class actually pleaded and begged for them to have to give the best possible score, otherwise that the person was going to be a teach again. Well, clearly, someone standing there and pleading for a nice score could contaminate someone's response when evaluating them. Another individual, in this second example here, says that the university mentor actually refused to leave the room while someone was completing the satisfaction survey. As you can imagine, someone standing in the same room while you're evaluating them could certainly tend to bias your results upwards because it feels awkward and uncomfortable to give someone a negative rating while you're standing in front of them. This is an example of the way in which the data being generated may have actually contaminated the responses. We as marketing researchers need to be sensitive that these types of uh, data collection practices could contaminate the data in such a way that it makes it unusable for our particular purposes. When we're looking at secondary data, we often can find more than one source of information that provides useful insights. What we need to ask then is how consistent is the information with other secondary data? Let's consider a situation where we want to estimate the percentage of all U.S. adults who identify as vegetarians. Using the Simmons local database, 
A study from 2018 and reported in 2019 estimates that 3.69% of all U.S. adults identify as I am a vegetarian. In addition, as an example of a study that shows some consistency with other research, there's a, uh, a study that comes out of the Vegetarian Resource Group, which based on the name you might estimate or might think there might be some bias in the study, but if you look closer you realize their surveys are conducted through the Harris Poll, so we would tend to trust that these are actually high quality polls and reasonably reliable results. And in their study that was conducted in March of 2019 uh, of 2,027 U.S. adults, their study found that 4% of all U.S. adults identify as vegetarian or vegan. And then finally, there was a 2018 survey conducted by Gallup that indicated uh, that 5% of all U.S. adults identify as vegetarian. Now, there's some discrepancy in the estimate of vegetarians uh, across these three studies. That could be due to just normal variation in sampling. This could be due to small, subtle variations in how the questions were worded or presented. It could also be due to different times when these studies were conducted and the rate of people adopting or pursuing vegetarianism varies within the United States. However, uh, what we can say is within this approximate time window, the rate of vegetarianism in the United States seems to vary uh, somewhere between about 3.5% to about 5%. Uh, the consistency amongst these studies encourage us, encourages us not to exaggerate the rate of vegetarianism in the United States and claim something like 15 or 